Thank you. Um, I just want to remind everybody that we are exactly 93 hours away from graduation. Okay, so, so my intent is for the next hour or so is to help you get closer to that goal because I, I feel your pain. I know the, SR, the PRP is done, Gaysburg trip is done, everything's done. All we're doing is waiting for Friday. So a <clears throat> little bit of background on me. Between uh, 2000, uh, July of 2009 to two, July of 2010, I served as the senior military advisor to the Deputy Minister of Interior for Counter-Narcotics, uh, General Dowd. Uh, he has since been, he was killed in 2010 on Memorial Day weekend, uh, and he's, the job has been taken over by one of the ministers out of Badakhshan. Uh, during that period of time, I had an opportunity to travel with Minister Dowd and the Counter-Narcotics Police. And so my perspectives are, come from traveling with them and also uh, my experiences dealing with the international community and the different people that are involved in counter narcotics. So with that, let's begin. It's a little bit of, uh, imagine a crop that's widely grown throughout a nation. This crop is supported by elements of the government and in some cases subsidized by that said gov government. When cultivated, this crop is processed and it's transformed into a highly toxic narcotic which is exported throughout the world, and is equally one of the world's largest industries, and at the same time, the cause of more deaths than many of man's armed conflicts. Therefore, through many nations of the world, okay, this, this toxic narcotic is man's. I'm of, course not talk, I'm of course talking about a chemical compound known as C2H50H, which is of the hydroxyl group, commonly known as ethanol or alcohol. Now, I wouldn't suggest, okay, that the use of alcoholic beverage is anywhere near the use of heroin or any illicit narcotic, but the Afghans would. And I want you to keep that in the frame, as a frame of reference in the back of your mind as we go through all of this discussion, that the Afghans consider alcoholic beverages equally on par with illicit narcotics. This is what we're going to talk about today. I'd like to point out that picture on the lower bottom there that was in Badakhshan. Uh, this guy is literally throwing gas on the fire. Um, they are burning narcotics and on the left there, vodka. Let's go through some history. <clears throat> I've seen presentations where uh, Afghanistan has, has been involved in opium cultivation since the 1300s. Um, it was largely used, okay, internal consumption. There's very limited illegal trade. Basically, the illegal trade started, okay, after people from the West started to move into those regions. <clears throat> the focus is really on opium and cannabis. Both, area, both, both crops grow very well there. Uh, the, the terrain, the, the climate in, some, in most of the areas is very similar to Central Valley, California. And there's also, it's also, since opium is a low water crop and there's, there's, there's areas there that are very arid, opium works very well in, in, as a crop in those areas. Historically, okay, uh, Cannon Doyle use it, refers to opium trade and Sherlock Holmes's opium usage and his addiction, <coughs> which came from his time in, in Afghanistan. Uh, throughout uh, our history of the, the Victorian England uh, history and uh, the history of our transatlantic railroad, opium, the opium dens, it's, it's used throughout that, that the 18th century and parts of the 17th century. Uh, recreational, cultural fe festivities, medicine, uh, tourism. Uh, I've had a, a, minister, a minister in Afghanistan, okay, once remarked to me that uh, using cannabis in his culture was very similar to having a whiskey after dinner in my culture. I've also had uh, <clears throat> an American at one time uh, reminisce fondly about the time before we had uh, a spring break down in Florida that uh, people used to travel in the 1960s to Afghanistan because that's where you could get the best hash. So th the history of drugs in Afghanistan is not just recent, it's, it's been over a period of time. And it, there's, there's different frames of reference for, for the different periods of history. <clears throat> but here's the stark reality. About 123,000 hectares of cultivation. Uh, Afghanistan produces 93% of the world's opiate. About 90% of that goes to, to Europe, Iran, and Russia. 
Very little of that, uh, of that crop comes to the United States. Our pusher of choice is Mexico and Central America. Uh, the uh, Russians do have a problem with the Afghanistan trade. They currently are on about their fourth year of about roughly 30,000 deaths for o from opium uh, overdoses. Uh, Russia, the Russian counter-narcotics minister has referred to Afghanistan as his country's Mexico when it comes to drug traffic. <coughs> Iran is a producer of precursors, have introduced methamphetamine to the, to, the, to the region. Though, however, officially they work with the government of Af Afghanistan to patrol the borders jointly. They stay on their side, we st the Afghans stay on their side to work together to, to stem the flow of drugs. It's a low water crop. Uh, as I go back, 59% of the opium production comes from one province. Uh, another chunk of it comes from the province next door. So, so Helmand Province and Kandahar produce the most. As I said, low water crop. The Russians knocked out a lot of aqueducts. The Taliban decided to, put, uh, to, to, to finish the job and knocked out a lot of the water infrastructure. So low water crops are what the people survive on. This just happens to be one that makes money, a lot of money for them. And it's also 4% of the country's GDP, and that's coming from a nation that has about 14 to 23% million dollar G GDP. Now, keep in mind that as we move into the political system, uh, season, most of the candidates are going to start talking about the military-industrial complex becoming more than 4% of the American GDP. So we, we get nervous when our military, DOD, gets more than 4% of our GDP for a country like Afghanistan having narcotics as being 40% of theirs. It's a significant percentage to have an illicit economy have that much, that much hold on their economy. Narcotics funds insurgency. It supports t terrorist activity. It destabilizes the country and destabilizes the government. That's what makes narcotics probably the beginning of the counter -narco of the narcotics insurgency terrorism nexus and they all support each other back and forth. It helps support shadow governments. It funds them. The insurgent, INS, that's not, the, uh, that's not a three-letter three -letter organization. It's just insurgent revenue is about 67 to $400 million a year, and it fuels corruption in the government. Now, your average Afghan views corruption as wrong. It views it against his culture, against his religion, against his society, and it, he, views, he considers it something that's destroying his government. For us, in order for us to actually to, to successfully interdict corruption and narcotics, there are three things up here. <clears throat> we have to know what the difference between intelligence versus evidence. Okay, intelligence can help us with, a, with an operation. Evidence you can take to court. You can't take intelligence to court. So that puts the onus on us, okay, for when we interdict narcotics, intelligence versus evidence. On the corruption side, how much of it is custom and how much, it, how much of it is real corruption at a high level? How much is uh, patronage networks? How much is it to do, do harm to others? There is a custom of people traveling through this, the tribal areas as they pass through villages that they pay a tribute to the elder. Okay, I liken it to like, uh, it's sort of like the Garden State Parkway in New Jersey. Every five miles you pay 35 cents. It's a toll to travel through the area, but that's not really... Corruption, that's tribute to the, to the local elder. That's tribal custom. And that's bakshish versus bribery. When you start to bribe the, minister of, the deputy minister of interior, okay, to make sure, okay, that this, this truck uh, convoy passes through Torquem Gate, that's called bribery, okay? When you tell the elder, okay, in a place outside of, outside of Natali, and you give him some money, okay, to pass through, that's, that's custom, so there's some, we have to make that decision, the, the distinction whenever we deal with the, with the narcotics trade. So, keeping that in mind, it's the relationship between narcotics, counterinsurgency, instability, counterterrorism. What's the relationship between the money and the poppy? Here's some facts about the opium trade. Historically, if I'd like, I'd like to point out that this is the beginning of the Taliban period. And there's a myth going around that the Taliban didn't like opium. 
That's true, they didn't like to take it themselves, but they didn't have any problem getting money off of the opium trade. And I would say that if you took this figure, and if I could get more, more documentation, this is all from UNODC, that probably during the Soviet era, it probably stated about this level. So the idea, okay, that, the, that this, this trade was, was in existence, and then all of a sudden the Taliban came in and it went away, it's not true. In fact, the reason why this number is down so much, if we were, there, was a, there was a blight, there was a drought, the United States invaded, a bunch of things happened, okay, in 2001. Al-Qaeda came in and they started to, the Taliban started to focus from internal to external to supporting Al-Qaeda. So there's a lot of things that happened in 2001 that make that number low. And then it picked up because they found that to fund the insurgency, they could, they could use the, uh, the crops. And keeping also in mind that a lot of people have moved away from the traditional crops of grapes, pomegranates, of nuts. When we, some of us, some of us older guys, okay, when we were growing up, most of the raisins and raisin bran came from Afghanistan. If you think back to the 1980s, the California Raisin Campaign, I heard it through the grapevine. That happened in 1984, which is around the time that we boycotted Afghanistan because of the Soviet invasion. So there is that alternative livelihood. They do have a tradition for, for growing crops, and opium not, wasn't one of the major ones. So anyway, but it picked up, if I can get this thing to work, it picked up, came to its peak in 2007, and then gradually started to come down. 2008, 2009, NATO finally recognized counter-narcotics as a mission for ISAF. Prior to that, it was not part of the mission of ISAF and it was not part of the Bonn Agreement. So they changed the, the, the strategy here to include it, and the numbers started to go down. It has gone down also. There, were there was a blight in two th early 2010. There was a, there, there was a, uh, the farm gate price went down on wheat, so there were some other factors, but it all is, is comprehensive on fighting this, this, uh, this problem. Here's the map. In 2009, 20 provinces were property free. I would remind you, okay, that poppy-free isn't drug-free, but, I mean, it's a start. Before, in 2006, 2007, there were only three provinces that were poppy-free, and one of those provinces was Kabul, a city where you don't grow a lot anyway. Well, for 2009, 2010, we had 20 provinces poppy-free. 2011, the latest one, we've dropped down to 17. So it's going to be a floating scale. Dropping to 17 is not the end of the world. I would say that some more work has to be done in other areas. But if you'll notice that the South is where the most occurs. And Faraz stayed the same. Helman, Kandahar stayed the same. We slipped in Uruzgan. Okay? But still, the advantage, the, 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 what I like to illustrate here is that the efforts of NATO have channelized the production down to the Southeast. And, and that's where it should be. Before, the northern section was red, though we still have a problem with labs in the north. Counter-narcotic strategy in Afghanistan. Pre-2009, it was focused on eradication. I would submit to you that eradication does not work in Humboldt County, California for marijuana eradication. I, it's not going to work for opium eradication in Afghanistan. It was focused predominantly on central-led, Kabul-led policing uh, sponsored by the DEA and INL. I have, you know, DEA and INL, they do fantastic work over there. But it was not a comprehensive program. It was not built, built on building capacity. Since 2009, interdiction and rehabilitation has become the focus. And they did away with the, folk, the, the, the centrally-led eradication and provided it it may, provided money to governors to provide governor-led eradication so the governors can judge their population and, and determine, okay, how much, how much eradication, how much interdiction, how much enforcement that the, the, uh, the province can take before it starts to tip towards the Taliban and the shadow governments. This has been a success in some provinces. It's been, been a disaster in other provinces. If I look at Helmand Province with Governor Mongol, a uh, rousing success. Okay, he builds, he builds mosques, he builds hospitals, he builds schools, whatever. I mean, 
If I go to Kandahar and the, the governor there, it's a complete disaster. It has to be, it has to be force fed down because it's a weak governor. And it's, that's a governor that can stand up to the Taliban, a governor that, can, that does, isn't willing to stand up to the Taliban. Uh, USAID, uh, more focus on alternative livelihoods, on trying to build the long term. It's, it's, it's not going to happen overnight. It takes five years for trees, those old trees, those old pomegranate trees to take, to take root. Uh, I've seen some areas where the farmers are growing poppy next to the saplings, and so the, as the saplings get bigger, they will, they, will, they will knock out the poppy because they'll, their roots will take over and the poppy won't be able to grow. That, that's going to be a four- to five-year process. Eradication, pre-2009, there was a lot of focus on wanting to spray. Well, if you spray the poppy, you're going to destroy any, ha any hopes of, of growing anything else. So the Agent Orange idea doesn't work too well. Uh, it ha it's going to take, it, it's, it's not going to be instant gratification when it comes to eradicating uh, opium from, or reducing opium back to the pre-20th uh, pre century levels. Another focus on rule of law, uh, we got the Japanese to help open a rehab clinic, which is something that the Japanese never would have even touched uh, because they wanted to just you know, keep it all at, at arm's distance, but we in started inviting other nations in to provide what they could. And then the uh, other thing is building the, uh, the capacity of the counter-narcotics police. Uh, the counter-narcotics police at one time was focused on just vetted units, three or four specialized units that the DEA vetted, and then you had the remainder of 3,000 counter-narcotics police running willy-nilly around the countryside, not equipped properly, not paid properly, great way to seed corruption, okay, in the counter-narcotics police was to just let them go with that. So you'll see on some successes, okay, that, that we are work towards getting the counter-narcotics -narc police into the whole police force as a whole has worked, and it's, it's, it's moved in the right direction. Uh, give you an example on, on successes. We had, in 2008, we had an operation called Operation Siege Engine, which is a purely counter-narcotics interdiction into Helmand Province. It had no uh, respect for counterinsurgency doctrine. It had no coordination with ISAF. It had no coordination with any of the ground forces in the area, but it was the counter-narcotics folks, or the counter-narcotics bubbas, going into Hellman, whacking down a lot of poppy, okay, making a lot of arrests, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, seizures, and it had no, rela no, no coordination with counterinsurgency. Following year, 2009 through 2010, Operation Mostarak down in Hellman Province, military operation. They advertised right at the beginning: if you are involved in the nar narcotics industry, leave, because we're coming in, regardless. So all of the, the narcotics producers all moved out of Helmand Province. So you have a coin operation with no counter-narcotics effect. So you've had two disjointed operations, one which did real good for the counter-narcotics but, but failed in the counter-insurgency, counter a counter-insurgency operation that failed in counter-narcotics. I'm happy to report to you after you talk with DEA a year, uh, last week that a year ago, Operation Kofa Kardan, which became an interagency, intergovernmental, international effort, was put, uh, came through, and it was more successful because it took into the into account counter narcotics, counter insurgency, and counter terrorism, and it also used all of the international partners. And the problem with working in an international environment. If you do not include all of the partners in some way, shape, or form, okay, you will have failed okay, in their eyes. There will always be a critic. But if everybody's involved, everybody has a hand in it, everybody participates, however so slight, and within their caveats, you have a successful operation. And that's what happened with Kofa uh, Cardin. I'd like to go over the, the strategies of the different players that are involved in Afghanistan briefly. First one is UNODC. Uh, UNODC, UN Office of Drugs and Crime, has been over in Afghanistan for about 25 years, on and off. Uh, they have the most permanent presence in there, and, and their presence is very non-kinetic. I mean, none of them carry weapons. It's very, you know, what UN, the UN does. Um, they have 
six papers, all colored. And you'll see this, peri- you'll see this throughout. This is a common, common thread here of pillars and papers and colors. Okay, so be prepared. Uh, where they target the precursors, they've, they've worked very hard with ISAF to get precursor chemicals, certain precursor chemicals that normally would be legal to have them banned and have them made illegal. Um, they've attacked the financial flows along with ISAF. They have a financial uh, team uh, that works in conjunction with ISAF, works in conjunction with the UK and with the banks. Uh, you've seen the opium-free uh, maps. Uh, the big tr- uh, thing is the uh, Iran-Pakistan border connection and the operation with, uh, with, uh, the, uh, with epidemics. Very successful on all of these, okay, but success is measured in small bites. It's not, you know, everything isn't a, isn't a home run. But, uh, but it is small, and it does work, and it is consistent. The ISAF strategy for counter-narcotics is simple. It's uh, simple because it relates to the ISAF strategy towards, the, towards Afghanistan. It's disrupt, develop, and transition. Okay, we've been through the disrupt the insurgency, protect the population, deny the Taliban, develop the Afghan National Security Forces, okay, into the most professional force that we can develop. We're not trying to make th- we're not trying to make the Afghan National Security Forces into the New York City Police Department. Okay, we're trying to make them into the national the Afghan National Police Department as much as we can. And then to transition that over, and we're starting to see that now with 2014 and what's going to happen beyond. Afghan National Drug Control Strategy. Here we go again with colors and pillars. Okay, um, it is built on the Afghan Counter Narcotics Law, which is a special law that sets aside from the regular penal code, of where if if you were if I was in this room and we were all a bunch of terrorists and we we're all putting together IEDs. Okay, there was a key, if there was a kilo of heroin in the corner, and the CNPA came in, the Counter Narcotics Police came in, they would arrest us all on drug charges because that's the easiest one to, 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 to convict on. Because if I arrest you on drug charges, within 72 hours you're going to Kabul, within 15 days you're being arraigned, and about within 30 days you're going to have a trial, and probably about 90% of the time you're going to get a sentence of about 10 years. So we thought that that was a great thing, okay, talking about how we had a 90% conviction rate, and then somebody pointed out North Korea has a 90% conviction rate too. But, okay, it's still progress because if I take you for IED materials and I arrest you, you're going to maybe get a phone call. Maybe there's going to be a phone call, okay, that says, hey, let my brother-in-law go, okay, and oh, my sister-in-law's in the group too, and let her go. And then by the time it finally gets to court, out of a room of 20 people, there's probably one or two defendants, okay, that didn't have anybody that can make a phone call for them. And after, the, and after the conviction, okay, there's probably going to be some phone calls to let him go, after, these people go after, after the conviction. So the counter-narcotics criminal court was the court, okay, the court, uh, the, the most important court that had the best rate, the best success. All of these are supported by the United States, ISAF, the UK, uh, UPOL. Uh, Germany has a separate bilateral agreement in some areas. Um, but building the institutions, USAID, alternative livelihood, USAID again, DEA, SOCA, and the U- and uh, and um, and ISAF on interdiction and law enforcement, eradication, INL, Department of State, information campaign is the United is is uh, UK, criminal justice is uh, is our U.S. Marshal Service and our DOJ, demand reduction once again Japan. Uh, some of the other, other nations that, that don't contribute, you know, actual armed forces, a lot of them are contributing, uh, and, and UN. Regional cooperation, UN, ISAF. Okay, so everybody's connected. Even though we wrote the National Drug Control Strategy, it's one that's being effective because they're, support, they're enablers from the international community in each. And this is our task, or the task that I had while I was in, uh, while I was in Afghanistan, that was help develop the counter-narcotics police. Now, it's a busy slide, but I'd like everybody to focus in on the four in the middle there, sustainability, accountability, and multi-ethnicity. In building a police force or building a security force or building a public service force of any kind, it can be the post office, it could be the public works, 
there are four common things that they need to have and four common uh, four core things that we need to teach the Afghans. One of them is sustainability, develop a force that the society can sustain. The next one, accountability, one, a force that is accountable to the society. They, don't ha they never had a sustainable or force that was accountable to the general population. It was always accountable to the governor. And I'll get to that later. <coughs> Multi-ethnicity, the force that you have, whether it be the postal service, the public works, the police department, or the fireworks, it has to look like the population it serves. And, you know, if I go back in history to, you know, being brought up in New York City, New York City had a problem in the 50s and 60s, okay, where most of the police officers, okay, were like me. They were, they were, they were Irish Catholic kids, okay, from the Bronx, okay, and they were all police for officers. Well, it doesn't too, do too well, okay, in, in other urban areas. So they developed teams of police officers that they would have a Hispanic officer and a white officer, they would have a black officer and a white officer, they'd have an oriental officer, and they would work those neighborhoods. And the police force gradually began to look like the population it served. And that's the same thing here. And I will show you some successes in that, okay, where we had a police force, okay, at one time that was only Tajik, okay, and in some areas it was only Pashtu, and in some areas only Uzbek, okay, and you could not enter into those police forces Okay, because you were not the right tribe. And then lastly, it has, every, every public service force has to adhere to some internationally you know, known standards. I mean, murder is murder no matter where you go. But uh, you, have to, you have to have a force that's going to recognize some internationally recognized standards. Our challenges, for those of you that have been, been to Afghanistan, this, this is nothing new. Um, we have an illiterate uh, population. They are starting to bring literacy, or they have started to bring literacy into the training of police forces. They started that in 2009 through 2010 to bring every police officer to the third grade level. And those that are, can go higher to like the sixth grade level, they make them into special ops guys, and they put them into ANCOP, or they put them into the NIU. Those are good things. This is a good thing, because a population that's literate, okay, is more likely to adhere to an uh, a internationally recognized standard of rule of law. Lack of leadership. It had a lot of problems with leadership because the leadership had, had lasted through the king, through the Soviet era, through the Najibullah era, through the Taliban era. Okay, we had, we had colonels and generals that were in their 70s. Now, they keep in mind, okay, this is a, na a nation that has a life expectancy of about 43 to 45 years old. So you start getting a guy that's got you know, starts to last into his 60s and 70s, okay, you know he's been taking something, and you know he's been living out of the country, and you know he's been living a higher life than the average Afghan. And so to get these guys out, to move out, to get the, to get the younger uh, population into, into the forces, they developed inher inherent law. They developed a retirement system uh, that would move these folks on, and that's starting to work. Not complete, but it's a work in progress, and it's, it's a work in the right direction. Uh, let me see. Okay. Progress to date. I promise you I'll tell you about that. The SIU, the Sensitive Intelligence Unit, which is a DEA organization that uh, does uh, sensitive investigations. It's very similar to the Major Crimes Task Force, which is another organization. DEA has about 45 of these throughout the world. And DEA is, a, is, a, is an interesting organization. They spread themselves throughout the world under U.S. Code, I think it's 21, I have it up there, yeah, U.S. Code 21, which allows them to work outside of the United States to interdict and make arrests for any narcotics that may come to our shores. And it's a key word in there, may. May come to our shores, okay? So they have the arrest authority outside the United States. They develop SIUs in, the, in, in various countries as partnership teams, and they're trained in the United States. Well, when I left in 2010, SIU only had 50 people. And we had a hard time vetting. They've since doubled. They're now at 100. And they're active. There's 80, 89 DEA agents in, in Afghanistan, 100 SIU, actively doing sensitive, serious investigations. Oh, by the way, not getting phone calls from the palace say, let, let my buddy go. They don't do that. Because what happens is it gets arrested, goes right to the CNTF. By the time the phone call can be made, okay, the guy's already in lockup. He's already been arraigned. 
sometimes, okay, he's already in the process of being tried. So it's a, it, it's a, very, it's a very good thing, very efficient. It's very efficient. It's efficient the way we consider efficiency, okay, that it's justice is done quickly and justly. NIU, the National Narcotics Interdiction Unit, is now at 538. When I left, they were about 320. These are the vetted guys, the guys that are like your special ops. They're very close to the DEA fast teams. They do, uh, you know, spies and fries and jump out of planes and all that kind of stuff. And they're the guys that are the, 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 the tip of the spear. So SIU, the investigator, the interdictor, the, 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 the guys that take them down, okay, are the NIU guys. All vetted, all trained with the DEA, the U.S. Special Forces, and U.S. Marshal Service. <coughs> Vetter unit, vetted units spread to the greater CMPA. I want to go back to my earlier comment. When I was there, only the vetted units got the right weapons. Only the vetted units got the right uniforms. Only the vetted units got the right stuff. Now they're taking guys out of these NIUs and SIUs, and they're spreading them out to the regions and regionalizing the counter-narcotics police, more so with the right toys. That, that does wonders because that reduces the corruption, it reduces the patronage, it reduces the lost cases, and it also helps interdict the problem. And now you graduated the first class with an all Afghan cadre. <coughs> There's one other thing. Um, this is a first, okay, to get the Afghans to train Afghans on what we've trained them. So, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a crown achievement for the DEA. But I'll also point to another one. If you remember about a year ago when the U.S. Embassy compound was attacked, um, and they had it on film on CNN and all the, all the shows and everything, if you notice, if you go back to look at that film on YouTube, there weren't any, there weren't, I wouldn't say there weren't any Americans, there might have been one or two, but for the most part, the guys returning fire, okay, were Croat. Because the Croatians had, have security for the ISAF compound. And they all had Croat patches. But the other thing that was really interesting is, is that MI-25 hind attack helicopters, misreported as U.S. Army Apache helicopters, were the ones that were doing the close air support. When I left in 2010, that unit had, had not yet been to the range. But a year later, okay, they were doing close air support, okay, on the, on the compound. So there are little hints of progress throughout the, throughout the, uh, the Afghans. Um, Police officers, highest number of female police officers, 65 is, is in, in, in the counter-narcotics. I'll go back one. They're going to bring the CMPA, the counter-narcotics police, out from underneath the Ministry of Interior and bring it under the Ministry of Counter-Narcotics. They always had two ministries, one that would develop the strategy and the other one that had the troops. You could never get those two going together. I mean, it's, it's, we have enough problem. We joke around, okay, about state making policy and defense, defense having to do it. Okay, well, you exacerbate that into the Afghan culture, okay, and it gets really crazy. So now what they're trying to do is take the troops from the CMPA and put them under the counter-narcotics ministry. <coughs> so that's a forward. Multi-ethnicity. The CMPA moved towards that. They used to be about 100% Tajik. Now they're 33% Pashto. Hazar is about 12, 11% Uzbek. <coughs> and the Air Interdiction Unit is now able to do regular general support aviation roles, not just pick up drugs, but they're able to support across the broad, broad spectrum of aviation. I don't know how many aviators I have in here, but when you have them, when they're just channeled, stovepiped, it's better to have all aviation to be able to do all the, all the missions. <coughs> Challenges. As I said before, we slid to 17 provinces in 2011. Um, it's not the end of the world, and I think they'll they'll see what data points or what things made that uh, go down to 17, and they'll be able to correct it. But it's a he still a heck of a lot better than 2006 with three provinces. <coughs> this is really new. The congressional decision on arms sales. Um, I don't know what the fallout is that, uh, of that's going to be, but it will affect the MI-17 and MI-25 program. <coughs> now, it's on one part of it, I see the problem with Libya and Syria. But on the other hand, the reason why we have former so Warsaw Pact weapons and helicopters in there is there's some economic reasons and it makes a lot of sense. Most of the stands used to be part of the USSR. That's the, that's the weapons that are in theater. The MI-17 is an easy helicopter to, 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 to fix. It's an easy helicopter to fly. It's an easy, it operates well up in the high, hot environment of Afghanistan. 
during the time I was over there, there was always pressure on the U.S. side, okay, from at home, okay, to why don't we bring in Chinooks and Blackhawks and, and sell them Chinooks and Blackhawks and sell them attack helicopters like Apaches and Kiowa Warriors? Why don't we give them Euronato weapons? Why don't we give them, you know, uh, you know, M4s, M16s, you know, 155 howitzers? Well, how come we don't do that? Because, you know, there, there's a motivation, and I know this is all non-attribution, there's a motivation, okay, for our economy, okay, for capitalism, to make a sale, to make the sales in our district and make the sales at home. That's good business. But there's a reason why we have those simpler weapons, those different weapons, the, the non-Euro NATO, is because all of the people that are buying the weapons over there are us. So we are buying the MI-17. We are buying the MI-25. We are buying AK-47s for the Afghans. The bill, when we trade in the MI-17 for a CH-47, is going to be phenomenal. But who, who buys that? The Afghans don't buy that. We buy that. So that, I don't know what the fallout of that's going to be on the Afghan program. But, I mean, there was a lot of resistance to bringing Euro-NATO type equipment in. Uh, we saw the M16 as a good thing uh, because the M16, okay, I get to stand next to an American soldier who has an M16. He won, so I have the weapon that he won with. Okay, so I'm like him, mono we mono type of thing. But when it comes to helicopters and tanks and artillery pieces, I think it could be economically unsustainable. Uh, coin versus CT. It's a perennial discussion. We have Title 21, uh, Section 959 and 960. The first one talks about being able to interdict or arrest anyone that may bring drugs to our shores. May. So that gives the DEA their mandate to make arrests overseas. 960A was started after 9-11, after and I think it narrowly, uh, it, it's nar too narrow in that it focuses only on terrorism. There's a bigger terrorism comes from instability, comes from insurgency, comes from drugs. It's not just guys flying planes into the World Trade Center. There's a lot more that get, that that's happens to get to that point, and I think it would be broader if that title was expanded to include counterinsurgency and counter-narcotics not just for counterterrorism effect, but for an overall, a larger, a larger effect. Uh, change in the CMP, CN law allowing the regular national police to make counter-narcotics arrests. Before, if we were in that room, that, dis that description of that room making IEDs and we had a kilo of heroin over here, the only police officer that could arrest us was a counter-narcotics cop. So if a bunch of regular police officers came in, they could hold us, but they had to call up a counter-narcotics cop in order to come down and make the arrest. Now they're giving those police powers through counter-narcotics law to all of the police. Uh, Pakistan and Iran, uh, they are problematic. Okay? They are the precursor link to Afghanistan. And as I said before, they introduced methamphetamine. It has a lower, uh, a, a, a tighter producer-to-consumer tail, so it's harder to interdict. And most of the things that go into meth, okay, are legal when they're, when they're apart, and they are only illegal when they're put together. So that, that's where Iran and Pakistan. That counter-narcotics court, they're having some problems because they're having problems with the judges, of getting the judges to, to work in counter-narcotics uh, in the narcotics field. A few of them have been killed, so that kind of keeps a couple of the judges away. If I can, you know, not deal with the drugs and stay alive and maybe take a couple of a couple of uh, a couple of Afghani, okay, and stay alive and keep the family going. Uh, that's a pretty easy decision for some of those guys. Uh, and then the last thing, okay, it, you know, Afghan rule of law versus Western rule of law. Uh, and this is the last point. Keep in mind that Afghanistan justice, okay, is restorative in nature, and it's not not rehabilitative like ours. Ours, we're going to send, if you get convicted, we send you to jail, we're going to rehabilitate you, we're going to give you some psychologists, we're going to teach you a trade, and then you're going to come out of jail and you're going to come back into society. That's the hope. In Afghan law, they've never had a police tradition below the province. And the province, the provincial police have always been there to protect the governor and not the population. And so they've developed the tribal shuras and the tribal sharia law that is restorative in nature. If, if you, uh, you know, steal from me, we gather together, okay, and the families come together, and we decide on a solution that restores honor, that restores 
restores, uh, you know, faith that does not destroy on the other side. You know, we don't cut it, that's just not cutting off of hands and stuff like that, but it could be, you know, for you return what you stole from me and then you give me, you know, half of your crop for the next year and you give me a goat or, you know, or something. There could be a marriage involved, but it's all restorative in nature, meant to restore back honor. That is kind of tough when we go in with Western rule of law in mind, our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, our ideas, and try to kind of superimpose it on something that's already been, uh, been going on for, for centuries. So now we have to find that, s- that sweet spot of how do we reconcile Western rule of law and Afghan rule of law and make them both work in harmony. So. And I'll leave you with Lawrence of Arabia. Question.